this is the most racist outbreak uh, statements uh, from a president that I have heard in my lifetime, and it must be universally condemned. I just think what the president has said is appalling, and he's trying to stir up as much hatred and dissension in this country as possible because it serves his political ends. What's going to happen this semester when a six-year-old kid has an immigrant kid or a kid from another background speaking with an accent in the room and makes fun of him? What's a teacher do? President does it. Mm -hmm. President says it. It's disgraceful. It's a good point. The 2020 candidates drawing a clear line between themselves and the man they hope to replace. And Senator Kamala Harris had her moment just last hour. I'm going to tell you what my mother told me. Don't you ever let anyone tell you who you are. You tell them who you are. <laughs> Period. And we will speak as who we are. We are Americans. And we will speak with the authority of that voice and all the license and authority that comes with that voice, which is to speak truth to power, which is to speak to the ideals and promises of who we are as a nation, to speak to the aspirations of who we are and speak knowing and remembering the history of who we are and speak with the authority that comes with the strength of knowing out of many come one and that's who we are. And he needs to go back to where he came from. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have whatever she had for lunch. Joining our conversation, MSNBC correspondent Garrett Hake, who's traveling with Joe Biden today in Iowa. We're going to get to Joe Biden, Garrett, but Kamala Harris there. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, look, that's Harris try. Well, look, all these candidates are trying their best to generate a moment out of this uh, back and forth between the president and the squad. Although I would argue that this is another instance in which the president with his Twitter feed blocks out the sun and he makes it very difficult for any of these candidates to be talking about what they want to talk about. I don't think this is good for any Democratic candidate. They can make the best of it. They can paint their contrast. But I don't meet Democratic primary voters who are confused about how they feel about Donald Trump. What they're confused mm. about is how they feel about this enormous field of Democratic candidates. And I can think of three candidates off the top of my head who put out major policy plans within the last two days, and we're barely, rarely talking about any of that. It's not getting the coverage. It's not getting the oxygen. What is, is yet another feud between Donald Trump and somebody. That's not to cast any, uh, you know, aspersions on or, or limit the seriousness of what's going on at the White House. But for all of these Democratic candidates, it's just another thing that sort of locks this field in place place and makes it harder for anybody to be talking about the issues they want to talk about and more completely introduce themselves to the Democratic primary electorate. Garrett, it is, as usual from you, an astute and spot-on diagnosis of the challenges these Democrats face. But I, I guess I would, I would just push back with the, 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 the possibility that that dynamic may never change. Donald Trump is a rolling crisis, and we ignore so much of the stupid human tricks, the things that he does where no one gets hurt. But we started this show with a Democratic congresswoman who's concerned about the safety of the four women he attacked and the lives of other immigrant men and women and children everywhere. So on this landscape, in this field, is there any sense from voters that they, they want to see how, they, how these candidates engage Trump? Or do they really, do voters on the trail really want to get back to policy? Well, it's an interesting point, and I don't mean to, like I said, I don't mean to minimize the, the importance of what's going on here and the, and the sort of base level at which the president has dropped the national discussion here. And I do think there is perhaps some value in that. And the way I look at it is from a different prism. It's the same reason why I think people looked at the way Kamala Harris handled Joe Biden on the debate stage and closed their eyes and envisioned her behaving in that way with Donald Trump standing next to her on the debate stage. I do think there is perhaps some value for these candidates in showing showing how they would deal with the Trump circus, how they would deal with his domination of media coverage. But I think that's one of a set of skills. I don't think that's necessarily going to be the thing that Democratic primary voters say, you know, look at how well that candidate X has responded to Trump incident Y, and that that's why they're going to, you know, be committing to caucus for them six or seven months from now. 
Uh, Garrett, weigh in on Joe Biden, both his interview with our colleague Mika Brzezinski this morning and how you're on the trail with him today. Yeah, that's right. So Biden is in western Iowa today. He has rolled out his plan for rural voters. It includes a big health care chunk. The interview with uh, Morning Joe this morning is part and parcel of this rollout of his larger health care plan. I've covered a couple of his policy rollouts. This is the most complete. I think it's also because it's the one that he cares about the most personally, both because of his own dealings with the U.S. health care system uh, during the death of his son, Bo, and also mm -hmm. his involvement in crafting the ACA. So he he knows this policy and knows how emotionally meaningful it is to voters, I think, a little bit better than some of these other policies. And it's been really interesting to watch him over the last couple of days. He did this in the interview and he's been doing it in western Iowa. Use this setting and this issue to really critique Medicare for all in mm -hmm. kind of an aggressive way. I'm standing in front of a rural hospital here. Uh, Biden made the argument at an event earlier this morning. Rural hospitals, he says, could have to close under a Medicare for all plan. Hospitals could not survive on Medicare reimbursement rates alone. It's a challenge to Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren to defend not just the concept of coverage for everyone, but what that would look like in terms of getting care to everyone. What does this actually do to the economy? Medicare for all is broadly popular within the Democratic primary electorate. But when you talk to voters, both anecdotally and in the polling, when you start asking people, well, what about if it takes away the coverage that you have that you like? Or what about if it makes it harder for you to keep your doctor or your health care? That support starts to erode. So you're seeing him engage a little bit more or on policy with his other rivals as he presents his own plan, which I've been calling essentially Obamacare Plus. It's what Democrats really wanted Obamacare to be in late 2009 and 2010, uh, but couldn't quite get done. That's the baseline, I think, for what Joe Biden is pushing as his health care plan. That's what we've been hearing a lot about the last two days here in Iowa. Uh, we're going to talk about Biden some more in the next block, but I got to get you two on the record on Kamala. Uh, I thought that was extraordinary. Um, you know, I, I agree with Garrett somewhat that de uh, voters are looking at Democrats to see what their policies are and right, how they right. score up against each they other. Are. But I think yeah. one of the things they care very much about is who can take on Trump and who yeah. can beat him, and especially who can deal with him when he when he punches below the belt. One of the things about Kamala Harris, she's obviously a person of color. I believe both of her parents are immigrants. You think Donald Trump isn't going to make that part of the campaign well, if she's the nominee? His son he, already retweeted uh, an uh, attack on uh, her, uh, a racist ex attack. Exactly. He obviously is. And that response, I think, was so telling because it it showed her not just showing the kind of toughness you need to talk to take on Donald Trump, but also speaking like a president, an actual president, speaking to the nation's highest speaking ideals. Speaking like a president and, and yeah. creating and matching the drama of the moment with the opposite of what Trump, Trump's yeah, drama right. is around the baseness, the grotesqueness of what he's saying. Her moment was, was you know, yeah. Sorkin-esque. Yeah. It was elevated. It, it was, was dramatic. It was dramatic. She was clearly angry. You were saying that yeah. uh, d while we were watching her. Look, she she showed the Kamala Harris that we saw on stage. She was angry. She took it to him. You could see her taking on Donald Trump. And she did two things. She, she called Donald Trump a racist, and she talked about the vision of this country and who we are. And it was really phenomenal to watch. All right. Garrett, thank you for spending some time with us there from Iowa. We'll keep calling on you early and often. We're always grateful. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.